Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Radio Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing RDNA 2, specifically further leaks that I've gotten sent over the past day or so for AMD's upcoming Radeon graphics cards. The next generation of RDNA will be definitely very exciting. AMD officially have confirmed several details. Hardware-based ray tracing is now, you know, going to be a thing, which is definitely nice. Variable rate shading support, yada, yada, yada. But AMD have been very cagey concerning how these GPUs will fare against Ampere, which is not particularly surprising. There have been a couple of hints from folks over at AMD that they will be competitive, but very, very little information other than that. Um, we did see AMD confirm that they were aiming for a 50% improvement uh, in terms of performance per watt over RDNA 1, and in my previous video I mentioned that they have actually beaten that target, it could be up to 60% improvement, but by far the biggest thing that I covered in my previous video was the cache system. AMD are dubbing this the Infinity Cache, and allegedly it's up to 128 megabytes. Of course, the size would depend upon the GPU in question. This seems to be for the 6900 XT, and the 128 megabytes of uh, cache would simply be because the actual GPU itself does not have the same memory configuration as one of NVIDIA's cards, like, for example, the RTX 3080, which is obviously using a combination of a wider memory bus and also GDDR6X memory. So I've actually learned now from a couple of other sources that it's almost certain that the memory configuration for the next generation flagship card for AMD is actually 256 bits. Furthermore, it is almost certainly GDDR6 memory. Before we go any further, I would like to stress that I have not been to AMD's laboratories and sat down with Lisa Sue and had her whisper things in my ear. This is through leaks, and while my sources typically have been pretty accurate in the past, there is also a lot of misinformation that's flying around, not least of which from AMD themselves. This seems to be an effort to throw people off. I believe this information is correct, and I'm reporting to, uh, it to you with good faith. However, despite the fact that I've seen a lot of evidence that my source has provided me, at the end of the day, this information could be inaccurate or they have been provided inaccurate information. With that said, let's continue. So according to what I'm learning, the memory configuration is GDDR6, not 6x, 256 bits, 16 gigabytes again for the higher end cards, but this 128 megabytes of infinity cache, and this seems to not be inclusive of all of the other cache on the GPU. So, you know, like, uh, you know, level one caches and L2 caches and that type of thing seem to not be included in this figure, at least how it was explained to me. But getting back to the topic, AMD's internal testing seems to indicate that this is equivalent of a roughly 384-bit bus, but actually works out cheaper um, by simply including this cache on the GPU die. This would possibly make sense, at least according to what I understand about how RDNA scales with memory bandwidth, and you would assume that RDNA 2 would be even more efficient with memory bandwidth. It's definitely a very different approach compared to what we see with NVIDIA. But, as the saying goes, there's more. I'm also learning that the GPU frequency seems to be at least as high as the PlayStation 5 for certain SKUs. The caveat, of course, is that, as always, it will depend upon the SKU, and naturally, AIBs will be free to crank things up higher and higher. This is quite interesting for a couple of reasons. One of my earlier reports for RDNA 2 was that the target TDP was going to be 250 watts for the flagship cards. The second thing that I reported was from another source that I trust extremely, well, just 
I just trust them very much. And they told me that RDNA 2, it can't go much higher than what we see for the PS5. And this is due to the way the PlayStation 5 um, obviously is implementing RDNA 2. With the PS5, uh, sorry, with RDNA 2, basically there's kind of like a limit on the architecture itself. It's to do with the uh, CU themselves, the buses of the CU, the intra-CU buses, allegedly start to break down in logic. And this seems to be the problem for cranking the clock frequencies super duper high. With that said, the source that gave me the RDNA2 information seems to be pretty confident that AMD can crank the speeds up to about the PS5 uh, levels. Of course, as always, given we will see a plethora of a AIB cards from the likes of uh, Sapphire or PowerColor or MSI or whatever, you can imagine that there will be a faster clocked variance and obviously you will be free to overclock as well, but it'll be interesting to see exactly how far AMD crank this to the actual limits of the silicon. With the PlayStation 5, it's 2230, and that's according to Mark Cerny that there were actually limitations due to the architecture. Um, that's why they limited it at 2230, but you have to assume that with the PS5, um, they were somewhat conservative because obviously they don't want to push it right up to the red line. Um, for obviously things like yields purposes. So what the actual final frequency is that Sony could have gone to, let's say 2230, uh, 2330, 2350, I don't know. But it is interesting that we are seeing that kind of speed, allegedly, for the highest end cards. And if you think about it, it makes sense if the Infinity Cache is true. Because if it is faster clock frequencies on the GPU have the benefit of speeding up cache speeds. So, logically speaking, and with very little information truly, officially, from what AMD are doing with RDNA 2, just from what I'm able to piece together from my sources, as well as how the PlayStation 5 works, and just generally logic of GPU architectures, it would make some level of sense that the GPU would ideally want to be fast so that the caches themselves can um, have the best access to data. It, it would make sense that this is how it would function. But there is also one final other thing, and honestly, I was kind of hesitant to share this with you because it seems a bit weird, honestly. But, again, I figured I'd share it with you and I would say to take this one with a mountain of salt, quite frankly. But I'm hearing that there is some type of smart shift for the AMD GPUs, possibly involving the CPUs as well, but it's not quite how smart shift works. So obviously smart shift with something like Renoir can divert power from the CPU to the GPU. This allegedly can't do that. Instead, it seems to be more like diverting speed from, say, the memory to the GPU, depending on what's going on. Again, maybe that makes sense, given the cache situation, but I can't honestly tell you whether this is true. It was a different person who told me this, and I'm going to treat it with some level of skepticism. I did want to cover it here, though, just because... If it is true, well, yeah, I guess you know about it ahead of time. And if it isn't true, then I kind of know <laughs> who told me it. But um, a couple of other small things before I let you all go. I also mentioned in another video recently that the next generation of Ryzen processors is allegedly going to be the 5000 series for desktop, not 4000 series. This is due to AMD wanting to... Uh, have a unified name across desktop and mobile. They've gotten a lot of criticism about that because it, they feel people feel it's confusing to customers. Honestly, I'm not particularly that fussed about it, but from a marketing standpoint, I can understand AMD wanted to unify the names for the Zen 3 based processors. And also, outside of um, gaming focus cards, 
There is a few very persistent rumours that I'm hearing concerning the um, GPUs for prosumers. One of those is that allegedly there is a variant of Arcturus which is designed for prosumer work. And I kind of had it hinted it was like Radeon 7. The problem is though that Arcturus never actually had a display block. So it's like, how this is going to work, whether it's going to be kind of an add-on car to your system, whether it's going to be like designed around this and have a slightly different architecture, uh, no one knows, basically. But apparently this will have HBM2 in it. I'm also hearing some RDNA2 cards may have HBM, but again, this is allegedly for specific models possibly just for Apple. Uh, Rogue Game and I were discussing this in DM, and he was the first person who told me that this might be a possibility, but um, I've also been hearing it from a couple of other people, so I'm throwing it in there anyway, but credit to Rogue Game, he was the first person who let me know about that. And um, I just want to also say that there are still an awful lot of questions for AMD's next generation GPUs, one of the questions I've got, honestly, at this point is what the hell is going on with the feature sets? I'm hearing that RDNA 2 is very competitive um, to Turing when it comes to hardware-based ray tracing, yet others insist that it's faster than Turing and hardware-based ray tracing. The thing is, obviously, that means it won't be able to compete with something like Ampere, but again, I will take that with a pinch of salt. I really want to see what the performance would be like across a myriad of different titles, whether that be path tracing, like, for example, I don't know, like uh, Minecraft, for example, or whether that's something with more of a hybrid pipeline, like, say, Control. It will be interesting to see how all of that plays out. Plus, naturally, we're also missing other feature announcements at the moment. I am hearing that there is some type of upsampling technology, but how this would compare against something like DLSS2, I honestly have no idea. It apparently works with lower precision operations on the GPU, much like we see with the Xbox Series X. But even if this is true, which I'm not saying it is, but let's say it is for a moment, how easy is it to implement for games developers? Um, or is it just like a global setting that can be kind of enabled and disabled? And obviously there are other questions too, like for example, is there storage acceleration or rather a decompression acceleration like we're seeing with RTX IO for NVIDIA? Theoretically, this would be possible for AMD to do. They can use their compute units, of course, to do that like NVIDIA kind of are with the CUDA cores. But again, no confirmation as of yet, and I'm hearing whispers, but whispers at the end of the day are not confirmation of a feature set. I am very excited though for what we see with AMD's next generation GPUs, and it's also possibly going to be a very fascinating time for gamers, because if AMD's CPUs, based on Zen 3, do perform extremely well, as well as the rumors of a potential 10-core processor, this could mean some very interesting decisions for gamers, um, especially if the price point for RX 6000, as well as cards like the RTX 3060 and 3060 Super are super competitive. We could theoretically build a very, very compelling system for several hundred US dollars, which should be able to rival an Xbox Series X, possibly even faster, and naturally, you could certainly go much higher than that. So, for example, a 5700X, assuming they will be the 5000 series, plus an RTX uh, 3070, uh, 3070 Ti or Super, or a 6700 or something like that, would put out so much graphical capability. And the last thing I'd like to say too, I'm going to be interested to see how GPUs from the Pascal generation and RDNA 1 fare over the next 12 to 24 months. And I don't mean in terms of performance necessarily, but in terms of feature set. I think there's a possibility that 
even if you're able to play your games at let's say 1440p high refresh rate on a 1080 Ti, which is still a beast of a card, you may still feel like you're missing out because you are going to not able to be able to use things like hardware-based ray tracing. I do think it's going to take a while though before it's super duper prevalent in titles, and I don't think all games are going to be using it super well. Um, at the start, because naturally it's going to take time for developers to fully embrace this. But for my mind anyway, I'm going to be curious to see how the market changes over the next few years in in in, in technology, especially given that uh, in terms of feature sets, yes, things have definitely evolved. Like RTX was definitely awesome for PCs, but obviously at the end of the day things were kind of held back because only one company were able to support this and consoles obviously couldn't do hardware-based ray tracing. So games developers at the end of the day kind of had their hands tied. And don't forget that NVIDIA's architecture too could do things like variable rate shading. Obviously they were calling it NAS. And, um, you know, all of this other stuff just hasn't really been achievable so it's going to be very interesting to me when developers have access to all of this potential tech, how games will evolve so bloody rapidly over the next few years. I'm going to be super curious. But with all of that said, thank you very much for watching the video. The normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And by the way, thanks to everyone who has been a recent subscriber or a longer term viewer. Um, while I'm on camera... I'd also like to thank everyone for helping us get to 75,000. Well, actually, we're at 76,000. Uh, I did say this verbally in a video when we actually did reach 75,000, but it was like... We just... Like, the subs have exploded so fast. Um, Amy's boyfriend, um, because for those who don't know, she lives uh, kind of, like, quite a distance from me. Um... And uh, he was gone away for the weekend, so she was basically kind of relaxing a little bit on that day, and I was going out the day of the subs going up too, and so it was just like, okay, um, that's fine. I've got, you know, I'm going to see a couple of friends this day, um, and I'm sure that we can kind of have a, you know, a day where we're going to do like a. Like, I'll go on camera and thank everyone in, like, my next, like, on-camera video because like, I figured that it was going to be today maybe we hit 75,000 at best. It was just like, nope. So, yeah, that was kind of, um, that was kind of humbling. We got so many subs overnight. It just honestly caught me completely by surprise. And uh, I was actually getting DMs about it on Twitter and uh, messages on Facebook. Like, dude, congrats, you hit 75,000. I'm like... Wait, what? Huh? This can't be right. I'm sure you're trolling me. No, nope, it was not a troll. So, uh, again, just thanks to everyone who has been a recent subscriber or a long-term supporter. With that said, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.